better than that. Come on, good afternoon. That's good. Okay, because this is going to be the serious one. Oh, turn the lights out. Well, that's appropriate because we're talking about courting and keeping students in the digital age, and so I think probably courting is best done with dim lights. Um, but we are going to do a quick thing to help our panel get a better idea of what we're going to be talking about. And uh, a quick raise of hands. How many of you are actively working in higher education? Okay, how many of you are at universities or colleges? Of those, if you're a faculty member, raise your hand. If you're an administrator, raise your hand. If you're a student, raise your hand. If you have a student, no, we won't go into the student loans, okay. Um, those of you who are not at institutions of higher education, how many of you are with companies that primarily serve institutions of higher education? Okay, how many of you have manufacturing, content, hardware, all of the above, none of the above, okay. Um, and anybody here a, a venture capitalists? people who are willing to put money into this space. Hey. <laughs> Good, I'll, I'll come talk to you later. Um, okay, the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna have each of our, and Josh is here. We're gonna turn this over to Josh who will briefly have each panel member describe who they are and he'll be asking a series of questions. But we'll start with the brief introduction. So a, a two, or th two minutes or so of who you are and what, why you're here before you start the questions. Sure, we will be the uh, entertainment as he gets up to the, to the podium. My name is Matt Patinsky, and I'm the uh, CEO and, um, of a company called Parchment Inc. Uh, before Parchment, I co-founded the software company Blackboard uh, and grew that up until just uh, about two years ago. And uh, basically the idea of Parchment is a very simple idea. We live in a knowledge economy, a time when skills and training matter more than ever, human capital. And uh, if you think about it, credentials are really valuable data. Whether they're academic credentials like transcripts, professional credentials, you're a certified wedding planner, there are certified wedding planners, um, and uh, a Microsoft certified engineer, whatever the example may be, even personal credentials, infant CPR, these are data about what we know and how well we know it. And in a knowledge economy, that's sort of the coin of the realm. So Parchment aspires to be a credentials data company. Uh, we do two things. We uh, network schools and universities together to move credentials electronically as data, which enables all sorts of operational efficiencies and intelligence. And we also allow individual consumers, the record owners, the students, the learners, to take control of their credentials, to put them in a personal parchment account, and then put the data to work, find out their chances of getting into college, find out how those chances change if they take a fourth year ban instead of a six AP course, have colleges recommended to them based on students like them, so we are a credentials data company. Hi, I'm Amjad uh, Safarini. I'm executive director of pre-health programs at Kaplan Test Prep. And uh, what we do at Kaplan is we work in the short-term uh, learning space. Uh, we work with many of the students that you work with in higher education, uh, but we do so in a compressed time frame, usually three to six months, uh, typically at the longest. And we help students prepare for uh, high stakes standardized exams, for example, for students applying to medical school that need to uh, master and keep in mind uh, four years worth of science curriculum and then be able to uh, faithfully uh, construct a mastery model of that uh, in an eight hour exam on test day. So for those of you that have gone through a standardized test experience, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, I hope, that, uh, <laughs> I hope that, uh, that you came out of it with a, with a, with a degree that you can use Matt's company to write, write on your resume. Um, one of the big, big things that we'd like to talk about is, uh, is how we get students through their experience. So because they don't really get grades with us, or they do, but they don't really mean much beyond what they see, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, a lot of how we uh, impact their learning is by affecting their sense of self-efficacy, their motivation, and how we look at what they learn and how they learn it. Uh, and so I hope that in the course of the discussion today, we could talk a little bit about motivating students in the context, not just of uh, traditional higher education, but also of uh, short-term learning. My name is Troy Williams. I am GM of the New Ventures Division at Macmillan. Macmillan is a global publishing and media conglomerate. Um, and 
as one of the big five, the only one that's that's uh, that's private and tends to stay private for a long term. For the long term, we uh, we tend to think very long term. We view ourselves as a learning company, and um, my job is to uh, diversify the company away from textbooks uh, and traditional uh, content in that way. We're the fourth largest textbook publisher uh, in North America, and um, and to build the buy, build uh, the companies that um, and products that are the software and services that have a huge impact on student outcomes and student learning. So the focus is identifying those types of uh, products and services and the ecosystem that has an impact on student outcomes and on the other objectives that, especially institutions of higher, um, higher learning are trying to achieve. And, and two of those core objectives that we've identified that we hear from administrators uh, on a regular basis our, uh, our retention and uh, uh, recruitment. And so they're two of the, the core factors that we look at on a day-to-day -day basis. Hi, my name is Fred Singer. I'm CEO of Echo360. Um, I've been in the technology and education space nearly 20 years. Um, Echo360 does uh, lecture capture and blended learning. Um, we help schools share digitally uh, the information they have, you know, to be specific, what we help institutions do all around the world is capture the lectures that they do every single day, allow them to be viewed by students on iPads and iPhones within five, ten minutes after class. Uh, we allow students to collaborate with each other, kind of the, the forerunner of study groups, and also communicate with teachers. And so in a sense, we are creating a digital platform for schools to do more with less. Um, the, the industry is actually kind of hitting a real uh, big vector point. Uh, we're in over 500 institutions, big, small, of all types. Uh, we're in 30 countries, um, and we have over 50% market share in, uh, in large universities. So this is a market that uh, where over 65% of educational institutions are currently looking. And so this is kind of a, one of the big inflection, I believe one of the big inflection points going on in education right now. Um, some of the challenges we solve and, and why people care about uh, lecture capture and blended learning specifically is uh, all the things you've talked about today. Uh, everything from uh, how do I do distance learning um, when I'm a bricks and mortar institution and I really need to leverage technology. What do I do if I have too many, um, I don't have enough classrooms or teachers to deal with overflow. Um, can I improve my educational outcomes? What do I do with English kids with uh, English as a second language or I have accessibility issues? So there's dozens of, of big issues that institutions are using and I probably end with the notion that you know today nine, over 95% of all technology used in educational institutions actually doesn't touch the learning moment. They automate the back end, they automate the records, they automate the administration, it's all great. But the actual learning moment, the teaching moment, that really helps in the academic outcomes, that's, you know, at a conference like this, it's far underpenetrated, and that's what we help do. Okay. Hey, thanks, Fred. So let me start out by asking you a rubber meets the road question. And I'm going to start with you, Fred, um, because you're the last guy talking. But I would love everybody to chime in on the answer to this. Because we're talking, you guys are all talking about interactive teaching tools, digital transcripts, and lecture capture. And are colleges using these things to improve retention or to improve matchmaking to recruit the students who have the best chance of success? Is there any data showing that this is happening? Um, the answer is yes. Um, they are using it. And I'll just give a couple of them. I mean, one of the challenges, particularly with retention, is trying to graduate all the students that you need to get through in the right majors. And so, um, you know, we know at Bergen Community College, for example, their average, uh, their average academic outcomes went up 10% when they were the students who used Echo 360. So we have lots of examples like that. But they're also used in different ways. So, for example, uh, I'm just going to use specific case examples because it's helpful. But in California, where they don't have enough money, um, they actually can't, uh, San Francisco State, they actually can't graduate enough students because they don't have the classrooms and the teachers available. And so technology and blended learning actually allows them to increase the throughput, keeps people from quitting, 
And uh, again, it's a place where technology is able to, to uh, help. And it's not just, by the way, a US issue. In Hong Kong, one of the big problems they face, for example, is that they're going from three years to four years. They don't, again, have the, they don't have the classrooms, they don't have the teachers, and what technology allows you to do is really increase the throughput, keeps people from quitting, and so there's, there's a fair bit of anecdotal and, and some statistical data that says it really does help. Troy? I guess we'll yeah. just go down the line here. All right. Um, no, we can skip I think, around. So I, I, I think we're early on in the stages where uh, we're using these technologies to actually drive retention and recruitment. Uh, it is happening uh, in, in, I can think of at least 20 or 30 schools that I'm aware of that are, are using various technologies um, to directly dr drive retention, and that's just what I'm aware of. So I'm sure it's more widespread than that. Um, in, in what ways? Well, um, so, um, well, first off, there's, there's a number of retention platforms that are uh, early warning, early alert systems that are, are being used right now. And they are uh, systematically beginning to try to integrate more and more data points. Um, one of those things that I'm very well aware of is iClicker. Some of you have been here today and you had clickers. Uh, iClicker is one of the businesses I'm responsible for. Um, and there's and, a number of And we've of been enjoying them a lot. Well, thank you. Um, one of those. I'm not sure what our attention rate is looking at. On the <laughs> it doesn't look like it was very strong. <laughs> <laughs> um, but w what we do find is that um, clicker use increases uh, student participation and has a direct impact on uh, student persistence semester to semester. Um, so there's a number of institutions now who are uh, trying to integrate that data in either just, uh, to, you know, at that one institution, or now we're trying to integrate it into some of these analytic platforms so it can be used across uh, multiple institutions or, or multiple departments. That's one example. I, I'm also aware of uh, some video, um, uh, a number of startups that are using video during recruiting uh, to identify the right student's cultural fit. They get a three minute video of a student in addition to a transcript. It gives them one more vector on which to, to choose. There's, you know, we could go on and on, but I think we're very, very much at the, at the early stages of this, mm -hmm. um, and that um, it will become commonplace in the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. Jed? Yeah, I guess our view is more on the uh, user side. Uh, the state of Texas runs a large statewide program called, called the Joint Admissions Medical Program, and it's meant to take socioeconomically disadvantaged students and, uh, quite frankly, get them ready for medical school, which is a you know, long, <laughs> long shot. Um, and they start very early. They start in their freshman year. These students are in rural areas, Brownsville, not your typical sort of UT Austin go-getters. Um, and so it's very difficult to get them high quality, even basic undergraduate education. One of the things that uh, technology has allowed us to do, including actually lecture capture technology, is to take uh, high quality material from places like UT Austin, and uh, in our case, actually, we take it or from the Northeast and, uh, and bring that and make that available to these students. Uh, we partnered with Adobe on this uh, using their Connect platform and uh, the material is, is available to these students in a blended, a blended model there. It's available to them uh, synchronously. They could attend the class and ask questions and then, uh, and then that, all that is captured and made available to those students for later review and they, they typically uh, take advantage of it um, to, uh, to re recall the information and uh, study it again. So yeah, it's, it's made a pretty big impact in some folks' lives. Mm -hmm. In addition to sort of projecting the classroom outside of the classroom walls and, and course materials, can this kind of material identify for individual students places, concepts that they need to learn more about, concepts that they're weak on? Can it identify area, ways that they learn best? I'm, 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 I'm going to stick with you because. Uh, uh, me? Uh, yeah. Oh uh, well, it, it, I think what you're asking about is learning analytics uh, mm -hmm. and, and sort of the personalization that you could provide to a particular student. And uh, I think what what you end up with is a platform that enables us to to have that personalization where it might not have been uh, available. So using the same example with the Joint Admissions Medical Program. Uh, not every student actually needs uh, high quality, um, robust, and remedial 
biology education. Some students actually uh, do a good job of it, and by creating some good differentiated assessments, you can actually weed out and try to understand who those students are, and, and, uh, and in some respects have them bypass that experience for higher efficiency learning with something else, physics maybe, or organic chemistry. Um, so using, using um, a blended learning, or um, in this case recorded uh, asynchronous material, we have been able to differentiate. Um, after you measure, you could differentiate and create a, a great personalized learning experience for those students. Ultimately, that keeps them interested. And that's, uh, in my opinion, I think that's one of the most important things is keeping students uh, interested and motivated through their learning. I think once they fall uh, either on the too easy spectrum or certainly on the too difficult spectrum, that, that sense of self-efficacy uh, falls off a cliff and uh, th they no longer become interested nor engaged. Mm -hmm. Fred, were you going to jump in? Did you have? Well, I just, uh, you know, the, I think there's actually a fair bit of data, particularly I'll just use in the capture space, that if students uh, are able to uh, access it, 90% of people who are, of students who are exposed to it will use it. Eight, when you ask them what's more important, they will, the uh, lecture capture blended learning rates higher than textbooks, high, rates higher than sometimes all the other elements, over 80%. I mean, it, it works. It works for people with disabilities, Gallaudet, School for the Deaf, it keeps retention. It works for people that don't have time um, to get to work and have to time shift. So I actually think it's a proven technology. It's not an expensive one, but I think technology at this stage is really able to help bricks and mortar institutions retain their students. I think you see a little bit, uh, I think it's a little fuzzier on the ability to attract new students. I think we see that in the UK, we see a little bit more of that, but I think it's absolutely something that's here today. Mm -hmm. um, Matt, you work in a space where attracting students is uh, part and parcel of it. What do you think? Well, I'm certainly an optimist, but I think the short answer now is in general, no. Um, mm -hmm. So there are always anecdotes and examples to the contrary. But if you take just sort of three simple transformations of a transcript, you want to move from paper to image, that's obviously not a big transformation, but there's huge operational efficiency there, right? You're not printing and mailing an envelope inside of an envelope inside of an envelope, which then gets opened and scanned and, and so on and so forth. The second transformation is from that image to XML data, because then we get sort of the machine capabilities. And the third is then semantic mapping of that uh, XML data. So we know that algebra is math and math is algebra, that a four is an A and an A is a four. Today, the state of the art for most institutions is really just give me the image of the transcript. Um, we're not even set up to receive data. And yet it's almost criminal to capture such rich data about students as learners and use it only in the context of the admissions process and not feed it downstream into the retention process, placing students into first year math courses based on the number of years of math taken, your performance in math, the level of math, that requires providing just academic eligibility checks. I'm in Arizona. We have basic regents requirements. A lot of students apply not even realizing they don't meet those regents requirements. If we have semantically mapped transcripts and students have control of the data, they can run those analyses themselves. So I think we're in the earliest sort of stages of thinking about data capture and data flows to get the kind of retention insights and matchmaking insights that you'd want. Mm -hmm. I think there's two levels to it. I mean, there's what, what we're finding in these early analytic platforms that are, are being rolled out, and, and retention is a very, I mean, I, I consider it a white-hot topic right now. Almost every day I see uh, uh, an article published on it, and it's uh, um, a conversation we have on a regular basis with university administrators. It's, it's one of the core um, uh, data points that they're tracking to. So it's, it's on everybody's radar, radar screen. The fact of the matter, though, I agree, is that we don't have the technology. We have a lot of spot solutions today. We don't have them integrated in so that we're seeing the holistic picture. But there's two levels here. The first level is whether or not students are interacting with some of these things. As, as you heard Jamie say this morning from Sapling, you know, people are using his homework uh, solution. Uh, students are using it avidly, it's the number one thing that they want to interact with, and textbooks were down at four or five. As a major textbook publisher, I, I, I <laughs> happily make that point. Um, we, we also have a, 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 the same thing with one of our products called PrepU, which is an adaptive learning uh, quizzing solution. 
and um, it's typically rolled out in a um, in a, a non-graded optional voluntary usage and when we're finding students are on average taking 250 quizzes over the course of a semester voluntarily. The very fact that a student doesn't engage with these things is the first alert uh, system for, you know, first alert, you know, early warning issues. So that it's, with, it's not necessarily getting down to the data of how they're using it, just whether or not they're using it is, is one core factor. And then you can get down into what you're talking about, which is where are their gaps? And with something like PrepU, we can tell very quickly where their gaps are in the course of a study and where there's actual, actual misconceptions. Um, so that it, it's not a gap in the student necessarily, it's a gap in, 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 potentially a gap in the professor's teaching of that concept because students who otherwise know the material are missing this concept. Um, that's that's a, a really interesting point. So this, is, this could actually help improve pedag pedagogy. Right. It, everything we're looking at, uh, we try to make sure it's based in, in deep pedagogical research. I, I just add that you, I think you pointed out that it, retention can be impacted two ways. One is, are the students using the technology and is it making their educational experience better, therefore they're more likely to continue on. I think the second one, which is more in its infancy, is how do you predict whether it's working? What are the, what are the forward indicators? And again, another one that we see, and some of the schools are doing it right now that are on the cutting edge, is they're actually looking at it, a precursor to whether you're going to do well is actually are you looking at the lectures online after they've been there. A student who hasn't looked at the lectures is very unlikely, has a very good chance, perhaps maybe not a graduate, can't prove it, but not, not, of, not of doing well in the course, sorry. And so one of the, the new tools that we see occurring that some universities are experimenting with is actually as you're able to tra transfer the teaching moment to a digital platform, there's a lot of analytics that come with it that people are now beginning to play with as to how to use it. That's in its infancy, but some of the more sophisticated universities are actually playing with that right now. Mm -hmm. I want you to talk a little bit about something that you started touching on um, when it comes to student engagement, which is the social aspect of these technologies and their ability to build learning communities. And we've heard about that from various people throughout the day that tech can do this and that can help learning. Um, in what ways do these tools help build communities of students and in what ways do those communities help in directing students to the right colleges um, or in, and to strategies that help them succeed academically once they're there? And Matt, I know that you've given this a lot of thought. You're kind of a dual use person here because as a sociologist you study social networks. <laughs> Yeah, no, I do. Um, and I, I think that's, again, we're sort of in the earliest stages. So if you think about retention, one of the projects that I worked on as an academic was to mine campus card data. So it's very simple data, right? You swipe a card. Well, all of the examples of, uh, in the retention world um, are around online learning environments because it's sort of the drunk looking for their keys where the light is brightest. I mean, it's, it's, it's useful and it's valuable, but those are the easiest data to get. But here we have card swipe data, and we're actually able to infer social ties based on card swipes. So two people are co-present, swiping their card in lots of different contexts, different times of the day. It's not just you and I in line at Starbucks, because we and student unions all have Starbucks, um, because we're going on to class together. But it really is, if you verify it against, for example, email log data, it really is a pretty good inference of social ties. And then you see those physical patterns of using the campus resources become predictive of, uh, of, uh, of engagement in the classroom and then ultimately dropping out. So I think that the, the reason why maybe I'm a little bit more, um, the time scale for me is a little bit more stretched out is you have a big problem just organizing the relevant data, right? Card swipe data, email data, course management data, let alone clicker data, the data inside of different kinds of virtual learning tools inside of the course management system. The whole data organization is challenging. Um, second, you've got a very nascent sort of product category that candidly is super overhyped if you actually spend time with these products and what they literally do. Um, so yes, if all of your faculty 
filled in all of the fields, which, I mean, they don't even evaluate courses, filled in all of the fields, then you could pop up for the advisor a red flag to do something, but then, of course, we're generally not well organized to do something in terms of what would we actually do. I mean, who would they come in? Who would they see? How would we support them to be successful? So you have the, that whole challenge of the, of the product, and then last but not least, the ability of, of universities to sort of support it. So I think it's just a, it's a very complicated problem um, to, uh, to address. But obviously, I think the, the long trend of time is, is like in so many other industries to put these data to work. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, when you look at, at self-efficacy as, uh, as a measure of, of engagement, um, one of the first things you sort of see is that students who uh, have a high sense of self-efficacy, that is those who believe that uh, they can accomplish uh, what, they, what they're out to accomplish, uh, actually look at challenges as things that they need to master, or that they want to master, rather than things that they'd like to avoid. Uh, and of course, that has obvious ties to learning and engagement. And so when you're designing your programs, whether they're synchronous or asynchronous or otherwise, you really want to tailor your curriculum, the scope, the sequence, the personalization, the uh, adaptivity that you provide to students by, uh, by trying to sort of get at that perfect zone of, of self-efficacy for the students. And that comes in, in three different ways. First is uh, you have to uh, provide students with constant, um, uh, constant feedback. Success uh, actually creates a very high sense of self-efficacy. Reporting on success does the same. And so you see some really cutting edge things with avatars and, you know, and things like that in, in some of the more recent um, instructional design. Uh, the other, honestly, is uh, social persuasion. So social persuasion, you, the use of merits and badges and all of these sorts of things, I think we're seeing a proliferation of that right now in, in learning. Grocket uh, seems to have nailed that one. Um, they do a great job with, with gaming. Um, and that, you know, in essence, what that does is it increases students' engagement by increasing their level of uh, self-efficacy. So absolutely, creating social platforms um, that uh, allow students to share their success um, that kind of virtual modeling um, it will help students not only in retention but also in engagement and eventually success. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Yeah, I think it's difficult to create um, s learning communities. Um, you can create the platform on which they can they can in fact create themselves, but it's it's kind of like you know deciding you're going to throw a great party. Uh, <laughs> you know it. If you're not, if you're not used to, if you don't, haven't, don't have some experience throwing great parties, chances are your party's not going to be great, no matter how hard you try. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, you know, so, so. But, but pushing that analogy, aren't we dealing with a bunch of adults here who actually know how to throw great parties? <laughs> you know, people who are, have been educators for half a century, institutions with 150 years yeah. of educational experience. Yeah, but so I, I, typically when we're talking about social learning environments, we're talking about peer-to-peer -peer learning environments, which are quite different than the traditional kind of pedagogical uh, mm -hmm. construct. Um, and and uh, so, it, you know, I, I think it's difficult. Uh, it's, it's just one of those difficult things. There's a je ne sais quoi thing about it that, you know, either you got it or you don't. And, and it takes a lot of iterations to get it right. Um, and so... I think that that's one of the harder things to, to see happen. I, I, I agree with some of the things that Matt said where, you know, we look at, you know, I've seen one of these uh, analytic platforms that's trying to integrate in the card swipes where, you know, are the kids eating by themselves, right? And, and, um, and various other things. Yeah, it's a little bit of 1984, uh, too, there where you... <laughs> I wonder how far we, we really want to go on some of these analytic uh, directions. But um, there is an opportunity to look at that data. Um, you know, some of them are getting at it with benchmarks, uh, mm -hmm. be benchmarking studies, uh, which an extraordinarily, you know, in the ones I've seen, extraordinarily high number of students are filling out uh, some of these benchmarking studies. They actually want to be heard. Uh, and they'll tell you that they're unhappy. So sometimes it's easier to go back to uh, older technologies uh, to get at some of these solutions, at least 
I agree, we're very early on in, in the retention world. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I have seen, how, however, how much time do we have, though? I mean, we, we're so, very early on. Matt has a long time frame. Well, so, you think there are a lot of inter iterations. And, you know, I heard from Jim Applegate this morning that we didn't have a lot of time. So I think we're moving the ball. I mean, I think I, think, um, I have seen various companies integrating various things or various universities integrating uh, almost each component that we can talk about at mm -hmm. least successfully, at least in one case. So I don't, I think it's not that we haven't solved it anywhere, it's just that it's the, it is this bringing it all together. Um, and uh, my guess is it's going, we're, we're going to really have a, a much better solution three to five years from now um, than we do today. Mm -hmm. And that we probably have that amount of time. I, you know, these universities are hundreds of years old, they're not going away in the next three to five years. So. Um, we had with you know Obama's completion agenda and the focus on retention and placement, uh, especially the the drive uh, and the and the focus that the for profits are under. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of of energy being placed uh, into getting this stuff right, and I I'm I'm saying when that we're going to get there in the next three to five years. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think? Three to five years, reasonable time frame. No, I mean, I, it, it all how you define it, you know, social community, I, social communities in the broader sense and a revolution in education, of course. I mean, we look at it in a little bit more uh, straightforward way, which is social communities for us is essentially a study group. And so mm -hmm. in universities, there are lectures delivered, people have questions, they post the questions, they need to ask questions of the teachers, the teachers need to put the questions up ahead of time so they can reduce their hours in the classroom. You know, is that a party? I don't know, but it, it actually works. And so I think that that's, that's probably the one step in it. I think the, the difference between now and a couple of years ago is that the academic questions people have usually come around the teaching moment. Universities and colleges teach. And so the key is if you're going to build a community, it's really a purpose-built community. Um, and maybe from there something bigger happens. I agree that when you try and make it something big, it's more complex. But what we see is just real academic interaction, which is people answering basic questions and teachers engaging, and that's here today. You know, so I think it just depends on how you define uh, social communities and and that. But I, I do think that um, you know the basic thing of a study group is now available and and amplified. Okay, Matt. You yeah, well, I, I think let's remember the sort of classic view of a college is sort of the famous line that, you know, the ideal teacher is Mark Hopkins on one end of a log and a student on the other. So universities do social really well. Um, and I think it's not an accident that Facebook sort of developed out of university communities and the natural sort of affinities within them, just as it's not an accident that MySpace scaled out of the, when they finally clicked in the music communities. Um, I, I think universities do social really well. Um, and so what we're talking about is bringing that online. It's, it's sort of, um, it's the next generation of data-driven social that I guess is the distinction I would make. So we take for granted that movies are recommended to us, but students don't have colleges recommended to them based on students like them. They go to their guidance counselor if they're high school students, but the guidance ratios are awful in the country, and the quality of that guidance varies pretty dramatically. So why don't we have the ability to have colleges recommended based on students like us, including their likelihood to apply, matriculate, and then ultimately succeed? Um, similarly, colleges, when they search students, you know, their incentive is obviously to get as many applicants as possible to reject the largest number so they're the most selective, which <laughs> moves them up in the recruitment process. But sort of social-driven applications would be about creating the best match possible, mm -hmm. um, which isn't necessarily a volume question. Hmm. Um, so. So for me, you know, social isn't the hard part because it's just inherent in the way that colleges work. Um, but meaningful it's, social. It's meaningful social, data-driven social, taking that social graph data and putting it to work to the larger purpose of better matches, to retention, to better instructional motivation, you know, the kinds of things that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. um, what, what are the other things that are standing in our way of using some of these technologies to improve retention? It seems that technology is second nature to the students who are coming in. I assume that in your market research, 
you hear that they expect it and that they want it, um, yet there seems to be a problem scaling it up, distributing it more widely throughout colleges throughout this country and, and in other parts of the world. I think that's right, and here I, you know, I usually think that most general technology tr trends, they don't bounce off of education, um, but we kind of overuse the metaphor of saying whatever's hot in another sector is necessarily going to be education's future. But I do think the consumerization of IT, that whole idea in the corporate space, that by bringing in our iPhones and our Blackberries and insisting they work, that we for the first time have changed the way corporate IT works to support us and our preferences instead of the other way around. I do actually think that that's, that's a pretty meaningful tsunami mm -hmm. for education. And you see it in tablet, you see it in a lot of different contexts. Um, but that consumerization of IT, I think, is a catalyst, uh, is a catalyst for change. But you're still well advised to take a conservative time scale. Mm -hmm. I'm done. You know, I think uh, going, going to sort of the last 100 years, 150 years of the traditional higher ed model, what it's done really well is sort of take many different experiences and brought them together under one umbrella. Um, and students have responded very well to that. Um, in that time frame. I think what's happening now is we're seeing really high quality focus come out of each of the different pieces under that umbrella. So for example, uh, we're seeing uh, technology get done better outside of higher education than within higher education. Um, similarly with uh, everything from sports to, uh, you know, to even the actual delivery of, of the curriculum. Um, and so I think that kind of external pressure um, is going to cause a lot of higher education institutions to sort of retrench and, and think and, and uh, look deep inside and say, really, what do we want to focus on at the end of the day? Is it the student learning experience? Is it outcomes? Is it, um, is it placement? That's uh, a big discussion, of, of course, right now. Um, and so I think that, you know, the, going back to your question about time frame, uh, Josh, I think there's a, yeah, there, there is a little bit of pressure coming from government and more, probably more so from industry right now. Uh, industry spending uh, something in the range of about $150 billion on workforce training, um, e-learning programs, um, and otherwise that, that get people ready for their jobs. And uh, mm -hmm. so there's a little bit of frustration that I feel um, industry has right now with the traditional higher education system, well, really any higher education mm -hmm. system. And uh, no, I, I, I've heard the same thing. I was talking with Ken Hartman, who's the president of Drexel Online, and he was saying that you know their bread and butter, which are things like executive MBAs, he thinks that those are going away. You know, in these economic times, corporations are not patient enough to say, yeah, sure, go ahead, spend three years. You know, we actually what we they're, what they're saying to him now is we want somebody trained in six months to. Be, so we can drop them into this project. Absolutely, yeah, actually uh, in the Harvard Business Review this month, there's a great uh, article about how Harvard Business School is undergoing the biggest change in its, uh, in, in, since inception, I uh, presume, um, where all incoming freshmen will actually be going out internationally and will be um, no longer learning case studies sort of in a, in a sterile lab environment of the school, Instead, they'll actually be implementing it practically out in the field. Uh, they're taking a book out of medicine, in fact. And as residents train for, for medicine, they train on real patients. And so um, I think industry is pushing that, and business is a great example where um, at least one business school is, is getting right into that um, practical experience piece of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the biggest barrier is that there's, um, there's a, a question as to whether or not it works, whether or not it's worth the investment. I mean, we've seen a number of articles, a lot of it coming out of K-12, but in the past month and a half, you know, New York Times, uh, a number of other major blog posts, there's been this whole kind of, it's been called a backlash against ed tech, um, and that it's not paying off. The investments that have been made are not paying off. and. Partially, I think that's because there's been a lot of pure play ed tech companies have built really cool things and they haven't been focused on pedagogical research and figuring out what works. Um, uh, and there's this, you know, there's this feature creep and they just keep adding features. Um, you know, when you look at that eye clicker, uh, we don't have any numbers on it. We don't have, we get requests for features every day and we're just not going to do it. It has to be simple, it has to be intuitive. 
but a lot of ed tech companies just keep adding features and 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 there's not any clear notion of whether or not it's actually helping a student learn mm -hmm. and there hasn't been enough focus on pedagogical research to prove that so what we have right now typically is at universities um, many universities individual adoption decisions individual choice uh, each faculty member gets to make a choice as to what they're going to use in their classroom oftentimes uh, the IT department can decide that they're going to uh, support something. So we may get an adoption at a university of iClicker. That doesn't mean that any professors on the campus are necessarily going to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, now they can use it, it's going to be supported, but we have to go out and convince each, each faculty member to do it. So there's a lot of fact, there's, a, there's you know, a s relatively small percentage of faculty members who are early adopters who, who, who kind of like to try new things. Uh, and then getting beyond that uh, actually is a challenge. The way to get beyond that is to actually have the administration say, we're going to cover some of the cost or we're going to, we're going to encourage you to do this in some way. And the only way an administrator is going to do that is if they have rock solid proof that it's actually going to have an impact. And they just mm -hmm. don't have it. They just don't have it in a, in a lot of cases. So I think that's what's different about what we're talking about with these analytic systems and retention systems that pull lots of data in and for the first time give that administrator a dashboard that says this product has an impact. I mm -hmm. have four sections of Physics 101. We used it in two of them. We have a control group. It worked. It had an impact. We did it over, you know, and if we're a part of a larger system, a community college system or a state system, we did it at different schools and it consistently worked. Now, we're going to roll this out. You know, we're going we're to invest many millions of dollars rolling it out and we're going to actually ask our professors very nicely we're not going to force them, but we're going to ask them very nicely to say, you should use this for these reasons. It's very important. And mm -hmm. as retention rates and completion rates increasingly become part of the accreditation process that universities have to, have to look at, then it will drive it you know, even further and deeper. But this is, this is all over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think an administration saying you really should, wink, wink, elbow, elbow, use this because it's going to help is going to create widespread adoption because to date no. um, when there's been central purchasing of systems there's been a lot of instructor rebellion <laughs> and the phenomenon of rogue professors going yeah you know this whole file sharing thing that they've given us I actually I like Dropbox better yeah I think it I think it comes down to again if th that professor can see data that they can look at with themselves, you know, with their own eyes and look at it and determine whether or not it's actually having an impact on student outcome and student learning, um, more often than not, they, they probably would. If it's like a lot of the technology that's been adopted over the last 10 years, where the university makes a decision, puts a lot of money on the line, and then says you should, but there's no, there's no, look, professors are research, most of them are very research focused people. Right? You've right. got to show them the research. And that, so I'm not sure, we could debate it for a while, but I'm not sure we can find a case where uh, an institution bought a system that was, you know, the research was there and the faculty still said, no, nah, I'm not going to do it. Certainly there's 10, 20, 30 percent of the faculty who might not do it. They're curmudgeons or whatever. This is the way they've done it for 30 years. They're not going to do it. Certainly there's some group there, but the majority of them really, you know, my, the faculty I know, the faculty I interact with, they really care. They're there to, to help the students learn. They're, there. it's, they're mission driven. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and if they think it's going to help the students achieve uh, the learning outcomes, mm -hmm. they'll try to adopt it. They'll try to use it. No, I think that, I think I'm glad you mentioned that. I think faculty are often painted as the villains in this technology adaption story, and it's it it really seems that that these are about I, don't know, I think there are about 700 university professors in the United States right now. These these are people who aren't just phoning it in. They want their students to learn. They want to teach, and they, you know, and 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 it really matters to them. It's just that the path forward isn't clear, and to them, strewn with obstacles. Um, I think you want to do questions. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say I'll I'll take it for the audience. Yeah, now. we do. We would like to you to ask questions. We've got a bunch of smart people up here. Well, at least we've got four smart people up here. One guy with a microphone. 
Hi, my name is Lee. Um, from uh, Azoric Technologies, we're in the web software side of the business. I hear a lot of specific, I guess, motivations you guys all have, but there's a consistent pattern that there's an increased cost for school, right? Mm -hmm. Students are facing increased cost consistently. What is the relevancy of that increased cost versus the effect of your services you're selling into them that may not be engaging that the schools themselves are saying, hey, we don't want to take that risk of buying this technology platform and distributing it and then sucking in that cost that doesn't help us create retention or engagement with them students. And in my field, we see high retention, high engagement. It's called Facebook. It's called Google. These are free. You can freely test all kinds of engaging content, technology platforms. And there's an extreme amount of learning going on in those peers. But in education, it seems like there's people selling into services, increasing costs, which is an investment decision for that university without even knowing if that's even going to be effective. And to your point about Harvard Business School, you know, I try to hire developers all the time. I hate hiring them from schools. And you can ask anyone in our field, because it's not relevant what they're learning. So how specifically do all these things that you're talking about when you guys are selling in services and adding at risk, how is that helping keep, I, I guess, courting and keeping the students in the digital age? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, well, God, that's, yes, that was a dark question. Um, <laughs> I can. Well, um, Fred, in our, so good question. You know, in our case, it's actually pretty straightforward. Students love it. They've been tested a zillion times. They love it. In fact, once it's in, you can never yank it out. Um, it's cheap. You know, the cost, the, the total cost for uh, a large institution to deploy lecture capture and blended learning is between, depending on the size, five and 15, 20 bucks per student per year. Less than, you know, I could pull 20 bucks out and buy a sandwich and that would, you know, cover the cost of that type of learning. So I think that, um, you know, Google and YouTube are great. In fact, they're part of it, but they don't actually deal specifically with what people are being tested in. So I think every technology has to be vetted against real, whether they work or not. Um, I think students are having a big impact on it. Uh, it's a hard sale in a university because you have a lot of constituents. Students may love it, but the people with the checkbook are the administration, and then the administration obviously doesn't want to move without support of faculty. So I, I, I agree with you, but I think there's a lot, and it just depends on which technology for which piece, and you know, it says all things, uh, lots of levels. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I think there's two different things there. First off, there was a lot of conversation this morning about, you know, um, that was along the lines of a number of blog posts that have happened this year of, you know, you don't need to go to college, you just need to learn, right? Uh, you don't need a college degree. There was one person who said, stood up and said that, you know, his children wouldn't go to college um, uh, because it's just not worth it. Um, and then there's that whole kind of line. But, you know, as we're sitting up here today and what we've been talking about during this session, we're talking about selling services into universities. And universities, uh, it, you know, so we're, we're, we're not, you know, I'm not really going to address that side of it. On the university side, I think it's what I was just saying. You know, the products that actually do have an impact in student outcomes and student learning, and increasingly there's an expectation of, you know, analytics that are, are you know, that prove that the, that, the, that the technology's having the impact. With iClicker, you know, we can prove that student attendance goes up if you have an iClicker, <laughs> that student participation goes up, and that students actually learn more if the professor uses it the way it's intended, which is they're going to, they're typically going to speak for a few minutes and they're going to stop and poll the students to see if they got it. If they ask them a, a trivia question, it doesn't work properly. If they ask them a, a well-formed question to determine whether or not they've really grasped that concept, then uh, the professor understands whether or not the students got the concept. If they didn't get the concept, he or she can go back and review and, and cover it another way until they've covered it. Okay. Uh, um, you see, so, so the point is that I'm trying to make is these things, uh, these technologies ultimately do not continue to get purchased if they, if they don't have a positive effect. I've got a question. Thank you. Do we have a question have from a question the, uh, the Indiana delegation here? <laughs> <laughs> the Indiana delegation. I'll speak for two of those uh, 
uh, ornery types you've talked about today, and that being the, the faculty, I am one in the business school, and uh, uh, administrators. Could you, could you just like tell who you are so the oh. rest of the room knows? Uh, it is almost a new group, right? I'm Brad Wheeler at Indiana University. I'm a business school professor and also the vice president for IT there. And across the whole set of conversations today, which I think has been a fantastic uh, day, including the, the last one, we've talked a lot about students. We've talked a lot about corporations and innovation and new products and cool things coming along. We've talked about social objectives. Uh, in what Jim led us off with this morning in terms of things that we need on the national stage and such. But connecting all of those things together really is often the institutional buyer who has to make choices and decisions and bets and rollout and education and support and integration and the faculty who then must make a, a second decision that the institution has provided Echo 360 or provided a certain platform and decide if they're really willing to, you know, take it to that next step. And I, I just offer the observation that I'm, I'm glad that's raised a little bit because the voice of those decision makers that have to make risk, I mean, even, even to your point, I got 110,000 students at IU, five to 20 bucks a head, that turns into real money pretty soon for this piece and then that little piece and then this little add-on and then, you know, how do you sew it together and such. And I do think that's one of the things that is an opportunity to figure out how to, instead of trying to speak around the professors or around the institutions, uh, ad adopters, how do we better focus the conversation to work through them to bring some of these innovations to the outcomes that we all agree are highly valuable. Hey. Okay. How, how do we address these institutions? So I, say, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, the comment. And uh, you know, a lot of what we do in research is uh, on learning analytics on the student outcomes. Um, we didn't talk a lot about it during today, but there's also a lot of uh, focus on learning object outcomes within learning analytics. Um, and that learning object could be a professor's lecture or it could be an asynchronous uh, video that's created um, either way. But that, uh, one of the things that we look at in learning objects is we see how they interact with one another. Do these learning objects independently create certain outcomes, but then when you put them together, they create either different opposing outcomes or potentially amplify each other's effects. Um, and I, I couldn't help but think along those uh, analogs into all of the discussions that were happening today. When you take lecture capture and then you take the ebook solutions that we heard about earlier today. As an administrator, do you have to worry about how they interact with one another? Do they amplify the effect of each other or do they potentially you know, destructively interfere with one another? Um, so I, I think it's a very salient uh, comment. You know, I think I agree with half of it. And this is obviously, <laughs> um, and it's actually what, what, your half that I don't agree with. And Brad and I know each other from a past life. Um, so that's why I'm being a little tongue in cheek. I don't actually think the history of higher ed technology is the lack of empowerment of the administration or the CTO, the Vice President of Technology. I think historically they've had a tremendous amount of influence over the decisions. So, um, so, so that's the part I would challenge a little bit. And I think this ties into the whole consumerization of IT as kind of a tsunami. I think it really is faculty and students in a very bottom up and organic way um, kind of adopting these solutions that is this next wave of change um, and I think tying it into cost, I do think cost is the overarching context that is sort of increasing the pressure on that change occurring. Um, and, and so the challenge obviously is you're in that metaphor stuck in the middle. Um, yeah, yeah, so I think the administration is sort of stuck in the middle, but cost forces change. The stakes of not making good matches, of taking out that loan, of going through a semester or two of a faculty member doing what they've done always again and again and again and then dropping out has now reached such a critical mass in terms of policy, in terms of um, personal finance, I mean all of the things that sort of ripple out of that, that I think you've got this macro context that's forcing change and I think you have a set of technology solutions that can in many ways bypass the administration and be adopted organically by faculty and students um, that will ultimately be, I think, the recipe for unlocking, unlocking some of this. So 
Um, so agree completely in the, the focus on faculty and certainly on students as well um, uh, as, as kind of a, a pretty big imperative um, in order to ultimately see it happen. I'd like to take one more question from the floor, if I might. And appropriately, it's going to come from the person who started us all off. <laughs> Jim Applegate from the Lumina Foundation. So in, in how big an obstacle do you all see it, or is it even an issue in terms of what you're trying to do, that we talk about using these to enhance learning? The question is learning what? Uh, we have a rather chaotic learning environment in higher education. I was department chair for 15 years. The course gets taught by one faculty member, it has one set of learning objectives. It gets taught by another faculty member, the very same course has a different set of learning objectives. The faculty themselves, when they come together in meetings, can't come to agreement on what a graduate of that program should be able to know and do. So, and then you magnify that across the system. We're spending several millions of dollars working with the idea that there ought to be some commonality, whether you're at Harvard or Sinclair Community College, about what learning needs to occur in mathematics, in, in, in college mathematics, going through the first couple of years. We don't have that right now. We're working on it. Is that an issue in terms of making it harder or, le or more difficult, or do you guys just Try to insert it in, where, and then whatever the learning objective is, you know, you're going to help make it happen, even though it <coughs> may be a rather diverse and chaotic set of learning objectives. We know it's a problem for student success. We know that kind of chaos leads to student failure because they don't know how everything's connecting together. What's the coherent pathway I'm trying to achieve here? But I just wondered how it impacts your work. So there's the question, can technology bring coherence or is technology simply going to partner with what's now an incoherent system? We're not going to try to solve that problem. <laughs> <laughs> That's way too complex, at least I'm speaking for ourselves. Um, you know, so, you know, for as far as learning outcomes, we're more, much more interested in helping have a common set of of understanding whether or not a student, a student learned something. So knowing what the student learned, but, but not trying to, to help bring the cohesion right. across a department, never mind a university, never mind na nationwide. Yeah. I th you know, ultimately, in our case, it's, it's, it's going back to the empowerment and trying to empower the professor to be able to teach what they want to teach and, and help them achieve that. On a broader scale, I don't know if that's our decision. I actually think it's the institution's decision to choose how they're going to do it. Um, the key, again, is the learning moment. And the question is, is how close can technology get to the learning moment? There's still, to me, a lot of technology not around the learning moment. And I think that, that once you're in the learning moment and that back and forth, then the analytics that come from that will be more valuable. So that would be my view. Mm -hmm. All right. And I think on that coherent note, about the problem of incoherence. It's a good time to stop. I would very much like you to join me in thanking our panel, Fred, <laughs> Troy, Amjit, um, and Matt.